Hi everybody. Uh, this lecture video is going to be about uh, informal logical fallacies. So uh, in this portion of the course we're talking about fallacious forms of reasoning. We've already talked about formal fallacious forms of reasoning like uh, affirming the consequent, denying the antecedent. Um, but there are some informal modes of fallacious reasoning that and this is usually the part of the course that's, that students really enjoy because uh, perhaps it's the most applicable to life, but it's also um, quite liberating to be able to learn about these fallacies and then identify them when people attempt to use them to present their points. Uh, the first one I'd like to talk about is scapegoating. Scapegoating is an informal logical fallacy that uh, involves blaming huge problems or even smaller problems on a specific group or a specific person when one has no evidence that that's the case. Um, it comes from uh, the scapegoat from the Bible, uh, from the Old Testament, was a goat that uh, all of the sins of the people were placed on the head of the goat. Um, so all the unconfessed sins uh, that happen throughout the year, like you, the sins that you don't even think of. Um, the priest then, you know, somehow transposes all of those sins onto the head of the goat, and then they make the goat walk out into the wilderness, and, and it, you know, dies in the wilderness. Uh, but it carries the sins of the people away from them. And so, if you think about that image, what you're doing when you're scapegoating is, uh, you're placing all the sins or all the bad things in reality on the head of a single group or of a person and then kind of just casting them out uh, without any evidence. So groups that have been scapegoated are um, Christians have been scapegoated, um, Muslims have been scapegoated, uh, women have been scapegoated, uh, minorities have been scapegoated, um, gay people have been scapegoated, immigrants this one is um, near and dear to my heart, uh, as my wife is uh, an immigrant to the United States. Uh, well, now she's a U.S. citizen. Um, but isn't it crazy how mu how many how much bad press and how much um, how many bad articles in the news come out about immigrants? These people uh, who, according to the media, you know you know, are like these bandits who come into the country and, and steal all of our jobs and all of these things. But if you think about it logically, uh, many immigrants uh, work in very menial labor, labor that a lot of uh, citizens kind of refuse to work in. And uh, the numbers, I'm not sure, you know, the whole economic thing where people say, well, the, the drain on the economy due to, you know, providing health care and all these things for illegal immigrants versus the productivity of the people, you know, like because they're actually doing jobs nobody else wants to do for way less money than, uh, than people do those jobs for. Uh, and so that contributes to the, to the economy, right? Because when you have cheap labor, you can, you know, sell a product for more of a profit. I don't know how that all weighs out. Again, I don't like to think economically. These are human beings who are trying to have a better life, uh, and they often have to go through intense suffering and other things in order to gain that life, and they often succeed. Um, and that's a good story, and that's what I think our country is built on. Uh, uh, the idea, you know, and it might not be true, but, you know, the idea that, that a better life can be lived here and people literally give up their lives in the attempt just to get into our country which indicates something about what our country has to offer you know, uh, but anyway all of these groups have been scapegoated and all the problems have been placed on them so don't scapegoat groups if the problem is a specific group of Christians or Muslims then talk about that specific group if the problem is um, a specific group of immigrants then talk about that group uh, rather than lumping everybody into the same bunch. Okay, another uh, invalid form of reasoning is appeal to fear, sometimes called scare tactics, more colloquially. When you appeal to fear, you play on somebody's fear. 
uh, to get them to believe some to believe your conclusion. Now, uh, p religious leaders and political leaders often appeal to fear uh, with their constituents and their uh, their congregations, right? Um, so, for example, in Christianity, the idea is that if you don't believe certain things, then you go to this place called hell. Now, of course, conceptions of hell differ. Some people don't believe that hell exists. Some Christians don't believe that hell exists. Um, others believe that it is this place inhabited by this being who tortures you and, and things like that. Um, others believe it's, you know, it's eternal. Others believe it's not. But anyway, I mean, that, that's very scary, right? Uh, you know, you tell like a six or seven year old, hey, if you don't believe these things, uh, you're going to die and go to this place where this, there's this thing called Satan. Uh, and you're going to be tortured uh, for, for infinite uh, amount of time. Therefore, you ought to believe these things. Now, if that's actually true, then that's probably a, a very good reason <laughs> to believe these things. Um, but it's unverifiable. Uh, and just merely, you know, focusing on the fear aspect is not sufficient for presenting a logically uh, sound, valid, or strong argument. Uh, but let's take it away from that. Um, you know, politics, uh, if we don't go to this country, then what's going to happen is that North Korea is going to attack um, Japan, and then China is going to support North Korea. They're going to attack Japan. We support Japan. Uh, all of a sudden, we're, we're caught in this nuclear holocaust. The rest of the world is brought in. Uh, you know, so therefore, we need to go and send our ships into the, uh, the Yellow Sea or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and really, they've presented no, they're appealing to your fear, right? Uh, because none of those things have actually occurred. Um, and of course, we hope that those things don't occur. Uh, but on a smaller scale, you know, like, um, uh, perhaps you know something about somebody else at work or uh, the example I use here is, you know, you walk in on your boss and you're, hey boss, what's up, going to his office and he's, you know, uh, lip locked with the secretary and he's a married man right? and you're, you know, his, his spouse. And it's and he says to you, you know, like uh, if you want to uh, keep your job, probably be a good idea to uh, keep your mouth shut. Right? Now, those are not logical reasons to believe that you should keep your mouth shut. Um, but because of your fear, then more than likely you probably won't uh, mention uh, what's what you've seen. But again, that is uh, an informal logical fallacy, uh, and doesn't present a good reason to believe something. The next is one of the favorites of students, the appeal to pity. Uh, the appeal to pity occurs when you say that something is the case or something ought to be the case um, because you've gone through all of these very difficult uh, times. And rather than aligning your reasoning with your conclusion, instead you focus on uh, woe is me, uh, uh, I've been through all this stuff, professor, therefore I should have an extension, right? Now, um, I believe that, you know, not all of those times are appeal to pity. One of the most dangerous things, I think, for grandparents is to have their grandchild begin college because your likelihood of dying as a grandparent goes up about a thousand percent if you have a grandson or a granddaughter in college. Um, grandparents seem to die all the time. It's amazing um, how often they die. And it's amazing how many grandparents students have sometimes. You know, you, they might have three or four a semester die, uh, semester after semester. Um, but, yeah, okay, so I'm joking here, right? The, uh, if your grandparents don't die, or didn't die, and you come to your faculty member and you say, look, I need an extension, my grandma died. That's appeal to pity. Uh, if you relate a bunch of problems you've had in your life and use that to support uh, a conclusion, it could or could not be appeal to pity. It depends on how you do it. Now, if your grandmother really died and you came to me and you said, my grandmother died, can I have an extension? I would say, of course you can have an extension. Right? You can please go be with your family, mourn your loss, um, my, uh, best wishes to your family. Finish your paper, whatever you can, get it to me and get it in. I don't believe that that's appeal to pity. Um, now, it would be appeal to pity if you said, well, my grandmother died, therefore I should get an A, right? No, I'm still going to evaluate your work based on the work that you've done. 
Um, but anyway, so whenever you, you somebody tries to make you feel sorry for them in order to get you to believe something. Now, this is the the ultimate appeal to pity, is um, the Sarah McLaughlin commercial, right, with the animal. Like, the, there's like an animal with like one eye and like two legs, and she's like in the arms of the angel, away. and you're just like seeing like a cat that like is all burned, you know, and it's like, and. There's literally no argument made at all. And the, it's just Sarah McLaughlin singing and then images of like abused animals and um, and uh, ones that, like shaking in the corner and automatically your mind creates an argument. But that is merely just an appeal to pity. Now, of course, most humans shudder when we think about animals suffering in that way. and. And we can make an argument, we can make a strong argument, I believe, that, that it's wrong to harm animals in that fashion and that it's good to feel compassion for organisms that suffer. Um, but in the commercial itself, it's merely just a song in pictures of, of, um, <laughs> of animals. You know, those commercials are so effective, especially, you know, when they have the children with, like, flies all over them. Um, although they don't tend to have those as much as they used to in the 80s. It was like every time you turned on the TV, there's like this Ethiopian baby with 50 flies on it. And and then you're just thinking in your head, like, what kind of, like, sick son of a gun would stand there with a video camera and video, like, this child and not, like, brush the flies away or, like, clean the baby or, like, try to give it food? And I'm sure that they do after they video it, but it's like... It's a strange, um, you know, you get a glimpse into like the horror of existence, almost like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? For people who, uh, voyeurs, you know, peeping toms, you know, you want to look in the window and see people and see what they're doing without them seeing you. Uh, and these, you know, these images allow you to see the world without actually having to, to participate in it. Um, they kind of like cathartically release all the uh, pain that you have. Uh, but anyway, Appeal to pity is when you try to get somebody to pity you uh, in support of the conclusion without any logical evidence. Another one, argument from envy. Probably seen this one before. Um, humans tend to not like people who are extremely successful, not like people who flourish, not like people who are really good parents. <laughs> um, have you ever had that experience? Of course, if it's a friend, do you have a sibling who's doing really well money-wise or or uh, has children and it's difficult for you to have children? Uh, have you ever met anyone who is really rich and you don't know anything about the person, but in your head you say, well, anybody like that is just a jerk. I mean, anybody who would drive a Ferrari doesn't care about suffering. They don't care about people because they're spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a car. They could use that money to like help poor people or buy toys for kids at Christmas, or you know buy food for people starving around the world. What a horrible person that is, right? And we don't know anything about the person. It could be the case that the person uh, won a, a lottery and is just driving this car around because they just got lucky, or uh, perhaps. They have a Ferrari, yes, but they're driving around a kid who wants, who's um, make a wish foundation is that he gets to ride in a Ferrari, the, you know, a month before he dies, right? Um, we, whenever we draw conclusions about people because we envy them, and usually this is a negative, um, it's really hard, right, to say like, wow, you know, those guys that just came into the bar, they're strong and in shape, they're really attractive. And they're smart too, like they're they're intellectual, they're stimulating, they're fun, they're funny, they're engaging, they're not mean, it seems like they care about people. Man, those are some good guys. That, there's no wonder why everybody's flocking around them, you know? Or, um, um, you know, like somebody wins, uh, you know, a million dollars at work, you know, and it's your friend and you're like, wow, that is so great. I'm so happy for your family. You know, you can do all these things. No, of course, we're going to get like envious, right? We're going to say, oh, I should have, that should have been me. I should have won. Who do those guys think there are? A bunch of jerks, big, tall, handsome, beautiful guys. It reminds me of um, Bottle Rocket, right? Where he's like, yeah, look at their clothes. I mean, like, they're pretty cool, but whatever, you know? Um, so anyway argument from envy occurs when we envy someone and then we 
say bad things about them or, may, or draw improper inferences about them without having knowledge. Now, of course, there are rich people who are jerks. There are poor people who are jerks. There are middle class people who are jerks. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, okay. The appeal to ego. This is also <laughs> another favorite tactic. I had a great student once. I couldn't help but love him. You know, never showed up. Uh, I was teaching at a community college, and uh, I just liked the kid, you know? Like, it was just one of those kids where you just know that there's potential there, that if they just if they just push themselves a little bit harder, they could, you know, really make it. And plus, just a really likable guy, right? Um, but he would come up to, after, to me after class and the times he would attend, and he'd always be like, oh, Mr. Harrison, you know, like, I love this class. Like, you're the best prof ever. Like, it's, it's just so cool being in your class. Um, but anyway, like, I know I haven't turned in, like, the past seven papers, so is it cool if I, like, uh, just turn them in or, like, and I can't come to class for, like, the next six classes, but, you know, like, is that cool too? You know, so what has the student done, right? So we often uh, call this brown nosing, right? Bring an apple for the teacher. Um, but you appeal to somebody's ego. But this happens a lot in politics too. Uh, a politician might say like, look, look, constituents, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I know you're all smart people. And that's why you're going to vote for me. Because anybody in their right mind would never vote for this position. And here's why, right? But in saying like, Look, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. You're all smart people. Everybody's like, yes, we are smart, aren't we? I like this guy. This guy's a great guy. I can tell he's the one. He's the one who's going to save us from everything. Save us. Save us. Instead of thinking about little ways that they can make their communities better, they want these huge changes and, and savior-like uh, heroes to emerge when those are just humans, too. So appeal to ego occurs when you, you try to appeal to somebody's pride. Um, by uh, brown nosing or, or massaging that ego, and then uh, you use that to uh, try to get people to believe an outcome, again, without much or without any logical evidence. Uh, the guilt trip. Wow, this is a good one. Humans have a strong, bad conscience, and uh, parents are great at using this one, right? So uh, have you ever... Uh, <laughs> this might be a universally sound uh, conclusion, but have you ever had a parent that made you feel badly about your doing something, um, you know, without any evidence, per se? You know, like, you know, the worst is when parents are like, you know, look, your father and I are not angry. Uh, we're disappointed in you. We're not angry. We're just disappointed in your character, in who you are, in what you've become. I mean, I remember when you were just a baby and you were so sweet, and now you're out all night doing all this stuff. What kind of person do you think you are? Rah! Like, no evidence, right? Um, and people make us feel guilty all the time. Now, this, this one aligns well with the appeal to pity, right? Uh, the appeal to pity is also, in a certain sense, a form of guilt trip because it's kind of like, well, if you don't pity me, and you ought to pity me, and if you don't, you ought to feel guilty for not pitying me. Um, now, of course, sometimes as children and even as we grow up, we might need to feel guilty and we might need to be made to feel guilty by others. But um, if there's no evidence, like let's say your parents are upset because you broke curfew, but um, all you did was uh, like hang out with your friends and eat popcorn and watch a movie, um, then yeah, okay, mom, I get it. Like, I miss curfew. I'm sorry. You know, I'll, I'll do my best next time. Uh, but if they keep coming after you, now if you're, like, snorting cocaine and, like, you know, getting the illegal poker game going and, you know, uh, I don't know, playing with some guns or something, uh, and then your mom comes at you and says, like, hey, you know, you shouldn't be playing with guns and doing cocaine and stuff, then it might not necessarily be uh, a guilt trip. Okay, next. Um, appeal to popularity. This is another really important fallacy. And there are different views about the appeal to popularity. The appeal to popularity occurs when somebody says, 
This is the case because a bunch of people think so. Um, uh, so, for example, you know, like, oh, Celine Dion is an amazing singer. You know how I know? She made $30 million last year, and, uh, you know, a million people went to go see her, her concerts. Now, does that mean that Celine Dion is an amazing singer? Well, I mean, we could do some analysis and maybe put her voice up next to other people. And yeah, she probably is an amazing singer, but the mere fact that a million people went to go see her doesn't mean necessarily that she's a good singer. We need some other data. Or uh, you might see, you know, make the same decision that seven million others have made and go watch, you know, like Star Wars Part 12, right? And then you're like, oh yeah, I should go watch it because everybody else did. But just because everybody else did something, it's it goes back again to mom and dad, or just mom or dad or moms and dads. Um, it goes back to them just saying like, look, if you if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? And you say like, yeah, well, how deep is the water? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, just because everybody doesn't doesn't mean that uh, doesn't make it true and there are some really way more important examples from the history of our society for example it was once believed that uh, African Americans were a lower were not even human they were not even a full human being and uh, a vast majority of dominant uh, of the dominant ethnicity group believed that to be true. Now, is that true? No, it's not true. Uh, and so that's a great example about how the appeal to popularity can really harm a society. Same thing with women. Um, women were not considered fit for, whatever that means, uh, certain types of jobs, certain types of, you know. Uh, the, the, the popular view is that a woman is supposed to be at home with the children, have some babies, that gives her satisfaction. Not that it doesn't, but it, uh, she doesn't need to be in politics or business or anything like that. That was the popular view, but now we know that was a huge mistake. It was a huge mistake. You know, our country is still suffering from the huge mistakes that have happened uh, in its history. Uh, although it's, it appears that we are moving in a positive direction, and I hope that we continue to move that way. All right, let's do one more, and, um, and then I'll do another video so that these aren't too long. Uh, Oh, and a, for, a form of the appeal to popularity is the uh, appeal to tradition. And this is a good one to talk about because this is going to be relevant to your own life. Do you have a job where everybody's been doing something the same way for 10, 20, 30, 100 years? And you have an idea about ways to enhance pr productivity, to do it differently. And you go to your boss and you say, hey, boss, uh, you know, I see that this conveyor belt has been set up this way for like five years, but really, if we had two conveyor belts and then we took the part from here and put it over on the other conveyor belt and then had other people working on it, we could increase uh, efficiency, I believe, pretty well. Uh, and your boss says, look, Justin, I get it. We've always done it this way. So we're not really gonna go with your idea because you know we've always done it this way. Now, is the appeal to tradition always fallacious? No. For, for example, um, stop signs have been used for a long time, and, and they're extremely useful. They prevent a lot of accidents, and it's, it's one of the best ways that we found out as human beings to prevent people colliding at intersections. Um, uh, um, there are many things in our society that are based in tradition and in good traditions. For example, like great beer, right? I'm a huge beer fan. Um, some of these beers have been produced the same way for centuries and, and there, it, there's an art to it. And, and that's the fact that they've been produced that way, the same way not only is cultural, but it has uh, so, social aspects. And, and it, it takes you back to a time, you know, you're like, wow, I'm drinking a beer, the same beer, that the monks, you know, in Belgium were drinking, you know, in in 1600. Um, man, they had some good stuff back then, you know. Um, so not all appeals to tradition are are fallacious, but anytime somebody says, and again, let's go back to racist America, you know, you know, you can imagine being an African American child and asking your parents, you know, you know, in the uh, the 19 early 1900s all the way up through. <laughs> 
the '60s and even further. But you know, mo mommy, why why do we have to go to this part of the restaurant and not all the white people go over here? You know, well, that's just the way it is, honey. You know, uh, that's the tradition in this place. You know, and 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 when people ask the question of the white people, why why do you have separation? They're like, well, this is this is the way we do it. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're going to do it forever, right? And again, of course, that appeal to to tradition was a fallacious appeal. And uh, thank God that uh, people had the courage and strength to stand up against those uh, fallacious forms of appeal to tradition. Same thing's happening today, though. Um, women, all you women out there, do you feel like? Um, because of perhaps your social beliefs, your family beliefs, your religious beliefs, that um, that you uh, should take a lesser position to a man, and that's only a question that you can answer uh, on your own. But if you feel that way, it's probably a result of one of these appeals to, tra to tradition. Uh, there's no logical reason uh, that, that a certain group of humans should be considered lower than another just merely based on uh, gender attributes, at least in my opinion. Um, now, of course, I should present an argument for that. Uh, and I, I believe that there are a lot of arguments. Just go read Mill, uh, uh, The Subjection of Women, because I would just be regurgitating what he said uh, and some other people too. But anyway, um, if you believe that you are less than a man, then uh, probably you're succumbing to an appeal to tradition. And I would encourage you to, um, to try to, I know it's very difficult, but to try to begin to think outside of that box. Uh, and I'm not attacking religion here, but, but if God does exist, um, then, then why would it be the case that God would make certain people less than others, especially if God cares about us? Uh, it seems that we're starting to flip these things on their head and that society is kind of moving in a positive direction when we flip these ancient ideas on their head uh, and we start to allow women to participate more and more in society. And women, you know, like uh, at this university, women are, you know, like 64% of our uh, students, women are, are participating in higher education at a lot higher percentage in general than men, and they're succeeding. And um, so intellectually, women have, you know, blown it out of the water that they can't participate. Uh, so just keep thinking in that way. I think it's important to, uh, to affirm the equality uh, between sexes. Uh, and that, that uh, certain ancient beliefs, even if they're grounded in, in tradition, uh, can be definitely fallacious. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and I'll do another video on fallacies. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you. Thanks for watching.